In this segment, we're going to talk about language grounding. Language grounding is a framework for thinking about taking the representations of language and the things that our systems are doing and trying to associate them with some sort of deeper concept, let's say. So if we think about what, how language is represented in our models currently, we're using vectors for a lot of it either kind of non-contextualized word to vec glove embeddings, or you know, obviously most of this class has been about these contextualized embeddings within language models. And so we thought about the things like word similarity, like good and great being similar, and them having similar vector representations. But what do these vectors really mean? This is a kind of deep philosophical question in some sense that has a long history in NLP and AI more broadly. Um, and it goes back to some work from Harnad called the symbol grounding problem, where Harnad defines a symbol system, basically a uh, system that can manipulate strings on the basis of rules. And he's contrasting his own uh, sort of notions of how this works with that of earlier work, where he says that Fodor and Polition emphasize that the symbolic level, or for them the mental level, is a natural functional level of its own with ruleful regularities that are independent of their specific physical realizations. So Fodor and Polition are basically saying that, uh, you know, having this kind of total abstract symbol manipulation is a meaningful thing, even when it's fully disconnected from the real world, and Harnad is sort of challenging that. And one of the thought experiments he gives is that of a horse, where, uh, or horses and zebras are in particular kind of, the way he's thinking about a zebra is that it's a horse with stripes. And you could express this symbolically, but in some sense, if you have a system that just knows about zebras and horses, it's not necessarily going to know about all those properties. Whereas, because we grow up perceiving these things and having a deeper grounded understanding of what these concepts are, we can look at a zebra and say, that looks like a horse with stripes. So, it, you know, in some sense, the measure of a system is, well, can it do the kinds of manipulations that we want it to be able to do? What does it mean to understand versus to just be able to do tasks, right? Like, is ChatGPT really understanding stuff, or is it just manipulating these symbols? And one of the classic arguments for this uh, is the Chinese room argument from Searle. So the thought experiment goes as follows. Someone is sitting in a room and they have a dictionary, a grammar books, things like that for how to translate Chinese into English. And someone gives them a piece of paper, like slips it under the door uh, in Chinese. And uh, this person in the room slips out a piece of paper that has the translation in English. Now the person themselves does not speak Chinese. They're just following the rules in these books and they're looking up things in these dictionaries. Now the question is, does the person, who, where is the understanding of Chinese coming from? It doesn't seem to be the person, right? Because they don't know Chinese. But there's this system here, which is the person operating inside the room that is able to do this kind of manipulation and produce these translations, right? So Searle argues that uh, the room is kind of like an AI system and it's producing these things similar to how Google Translate produces translations in Chinese. Um, and Harnad is sort of a riff on this, which is that the reason that we think that some sort of understanding is happening is entirely projected from ourselves. He says, the interpretation will not be intrinsic to the symbol system itself. It will be parasitic on the fact that the symbols have meaning for us in exactly the same way that the meaning of the symbols is in a book are not in, ex, intrinsic, but derived from the meanings in our heads. So he's basically saying, we think that there's understanding going on here because we see this translation process happening, but in fact, no such understanding is happening. So this, I, the reason I bring all this up is because it's very relevant to conversations around large language models. Uh, and in particular, it was all kind of revived a few years ago uh, with an argument from Bender and Kohler called Climbing Towards NLU, where they are thinking about the ability of these systems to manipulate form versus actually engage with meaning or the kind of communicate, communicative intent of speakers. And their argument is basically that a language model is really good at kind of pushing these symbols around, but there's no underlying intent. It's sort of like telling you a story and generating symbols, but that's not grounded in anything. 
And so one of their thought experiments is that they're imagining an octopus sort of analogous to a language model eavesdropping on a conversation between two people that are on like neighboring islands. And then the octopus decides to insert itself into the conversation. And then one of the people needs to basically construct something on land to fend off a bear. And the octopus is sort of, uh, I guess, a fish out of water, pun intended, uh, because it can't actually understand what a bear is or how to deal with that, right? So this thought experiment sort of suggests that maybe even though it's seen all of this like language between A and B and it knows a lot about the situation, the fact that it doesn't know this physical situation is a fundamental limitation. Now, the, that sort of argument leads in the direction of saying that, okay, if you're just training a language model on the web, maybe you're not actually going to learn what these symbols mean. You just learn that things co-occur. And so if you're doing something like question answering, you're going to generate something that looks like an answer to a question, but is not the answer. So there have been a few counter arguments to this. One is that yeah, if we think about like the context of code, it's hard to learn meaning from just language modeling over code if we think about strings like this, right? We are modeling the string print y, but we have no idea what the value of y is going to be, and this like like just generating this code sequence doesn't really tell us anything. On the other hand, let's suppose we're modeling a we're training our language model over some code that has assert statements in it. Now we have this assert statement of assert y equals equals 4. Now imagine that we're training a language model on this, right? Um, and so our language model has, at some point, you know, has encoded all of this stuff, and now it's going to try to predict the next token, which in this case is 4. Well, in order to figure that out, in order to maximize the likelihood of the right thing, it has to actually learn that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So, there's a, there's a similar argument that can be made for natural language, which relies on the assumption uh, that people say true things. Now, if you consider a pair of statements by the same person, x1 followed by x2, given enough examples, you kind of learn to model the distribution of x2, and if you assume that what people say is true, you're going to learn the distribution or learn to assign more probability mass to true things rather than false things. So you learn a little bit of meaning here. A little bit creeps in even from just doing raw language modeling, and that still kind of tells us something. So there's a lot of philosophy around this. I think kind of zooming out from the perspective of like, well, what is meaning? What is understanding? Are these models sentient? Things like that. Uh, we can think a little bit more pragmatically about what the different levels of complexity that these models might be able to engage with are when we think about grounding. So there's a paper called Experience Ground Language, Grounds Language due to Jonathan Viscadal that thinks about five levels of world scope starting with corpus, then the internet, then perception, then embodiment, then social. And I think it's reasonably well accepted in the field that if you have a pure language model, that's somehow more restrictive than a model that is tuned on both language data and, let's say, images or computer vision. I mean, in some sense, the second one is just purely a superset of the first one, right? And then similarly, if you add manipulation into the mix, right, now that's adding another dimension on top of it, this kind of embodiment and interaction with the world, right? And we haven't quite gotten to social yet, and I think that uh, it's taking time to kind of climb through this hierarchy with models that are actually as good as things like GPT-4. But I think what we're probably going to still see this trend uh, sort of continuing uh, as the field progresses. That's the end of this segment.